talk first about the fundamental powers of the state. If you cannot appreciate what the Bill of Rights is all about, if you don't know against which it is arrayed against. Like, would you have an appreciation for your gender if there was no opposite sex? Unless you are perhaps part of that land. So, when we talk about constitutional law, it has something to do with balancing. It's like riding a bicycle. If you don't know how to use a bicycle, because you don't know how to balance yourself, then the bicycle would be useless for you. It would never move, because you would keep on falling down. So you have to know how to balance, how not to fall into one side or the other side, in order that you can now move forward. Early on in your study of law, it was in your first year, some 10 years ago, You started thinking of taking up law when you're still in first year undergrad, right? Like, you might have taken accountancy, but you were looking forward already to becoming lawyers after that. What's that? USD on top. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you know the implication of that? <laughs> when you have to be on top? <laughs> Am I having deja vu? There's so many familiar faces. And I'm reminded of that movie in HBO Sam. I think a week ago, Ghost Town. I'm missing Ghost. <laughs> so going back to your first year, you must have read the case of Kalalang versus Williams. It has something to do with the so-called animal drone vehicles known as pedicabs. No, Kalesas. So, at that early time, we already had some problems with traffic. And there the Supreme Court says that there's a need to balance between liberty and authority. If you have too much of authority, then you would have tyranny. But if you have too much of liberty, then you would also have anarchy. And you can very well imagine that either are not acceptable. Therefore, there's a need to carefully balance in order that you could have a viable society. So that basically illustrates the idea behind constitutional law. But take note that constitutional law is not simply a matter of trying to balance between right and wrong, left or right. Sometimes it also means that you have to make choices between two things which are desirable and good, but something has to give. Just like making choices when two desirable boyfriends are asking for your hand. You cannot have them both, right? They're both good. They're both handsome. They're both wealthy. But somehow, you have to make a choice. But when it comes to guys, it's not much of a problem. They just take them both. <laughs> so, the fundamental powers of the state, you very well know, the police power, power of eminent domain, and power of taxation. They are inherent in the sense that they do not need any law for them to be vested. They come into being simply because the state comes into being. So if ever you need law in regard to these powers, it is to provide some limitations on them, not to vest them, but in order that they be somehow restrained. 
this power would be the most pervasive. But even as it might be the most powerful, still subject to some limitations. So for the valid exercise of police power, you have the need for lawful end to be accomplished through lawful means. Lawful end in the sense that the interest of the public in general would demand its exercise and lawful means in the sense that whatever is adopted for the purpose of accomplishing that objective must be done in a manner that is not unduly oppressive in the rights of individuals and one which should be reasonable. A good example to illustrate this idea would be the two cases involving Karabaos. We have the case of Enoch as well as the case of Toribio. In the case of Toribio, the Supreme Court upheld the power of the state to regulate your, uh, your use of your property, Carabao, for the general welfare, considering at the time that the Carabaos were very useful in field work. So you cannot just slaughter your Carabao, even if you wanted to eat it, because of the need to preserve the Carabao. Otherwise, there will be a problem for the larger community if there would now be lack of carabaos which, which would be utilized for the purpose of raising, for instance, rice or other crops. In the case of Eno, there was also a need to preserve the carabaos, particularly in regard to cattle rustling. But just the same, the Supreme Court said the means adopted would not be consistent with the idea of due process because for one, there was arbitrariness, and for another, the means were not reasonable. So in that case, even as there was a valid end, the same could not be accomplished through a local means. Therefore, that law, or that executive order, was declared to be an invalidity. Police power is something that develops through time. So it's not the same as it was in the past. A good example for that would be the case of Binay versus Domingo. So if you're familiar with the advertisements of Binay just before the start or the onset of the campaign period, you would have seen how he's trying to convince the Philippines to elect him to office so that the Philippines may somehow have the same experience as what Makati had when he was the mayor of Malacca, you know? like the kinds of services, free services, for the poor, for the senior citizens, and the like. So in the case of Binay versus Domingo, there was this burial assistance program that was adopted in Makati. Owa said that cannot be done because only a few would be the direct beneficiaries of that program. So that represented an improper expenditure of public funds. To Kowa, the public in general must be the beneficiary and not simply a few. The Supreme Court said, Kowa, your ideas are just like those of an old mate. No, the Supreme Court did not say that, but in effect it was saying it. Your ideas belong to the past. If Formerly, there was a need that the public in general be the direct beneficiaries of the expenditure of public funds. Such is no longer the case, especially with the adoption of social justice. So even if only a few would be the direct beneficiaries, still it is a means by which the government serves the people. Therefore, that can be considered as a valid expenditure of public funds. Also, Take note of what was said in the case of Benson versus Trilon. The Supreme Court said, what was robbery in 1874 is now known as social justice. So that could only illustrate how certain concepts develop through time. If in the past it was improper for the government to get money from the rich in order that it could deliver certain services or give part of the money to the poor, now, that is ordinarily taken for granted. And in the more recent case of Erochi versus 
Department of Energy, the Supreme Court took note of the fact that police power is now being used to promote the advancement of public welfare, public interest, and so on, compared to the past where it might just have been used for the purpose of preserving public health and the like, or morals. No, so as you can see, public or police power is now increasingly being utilized in a proactive manner. Not simply to help preserve what's already there, but to effect some other changes in society for the purpose of benefiting the people. And in that regard, what was an issue was with regard to with respect to the regulation of the energy sector, electricity. Now, let's take a look at some of the more recent applications of police power. In less than a month, you now have another set of elections. So if you want to be elected, you have to devise a lot of ways, find certain measures by which the people could notice you. That normally is done through campaigning and election materials. In the case of Chavez or the Skomelec, Chavez, you still remember him, he's a suspenders? Or you don't? You're too young for that. Or so you would like to make it appear. He had some contracts for the promotion of certain products. And for that, he was paid to advertise these products. However, in 2004, he also decided to run for the Senate. And by virtue of that, he was affected by a common resolution which required that those who filed their certificates of candidacy should discontinue though the commercial endorsements they had for certain products. So if you remember, if you endorse certain products, you may see your face or your, you may hear your voice on radio and television. You may appear in newspapers and be heard over the radio. Or you might have these big billboards advertising your face, your body, whatever, and that's for everyone to see. But if you now run for public office, you are subjected to certain restrictions in regard to the kind of campaign materials that you would have. So the Comelec said those kinds of advertisements should be discontinued in the meantime that you have this electoral exercise. Chavez said that's not fair. But the Supreme Court said it's only being fair. It is intended to level the playing field. Because otherwise, those who don't have these kinds of endorsements would suffer compared to those who have this, these activities. And moreover, they would now be able to circumvent those restrictions on campaign advertisements. Like, what if they appeared in big billboards around, along EDSA, for instance, or along the SLEX and NLEX? So these billboards would be much bigger than what would be allowed as legitimate campaign materials. While it is true that they would not be asking the people to vote for them through those billboards, the people could not possibly help identifying those persons who's, who have these advertisements and Therefore, they would have a new advantage over other candidates who are hardly known by the electorate. So, in that case, the Supreme Court said the Comelec resolution is valid. If you remember, in 2007, Pacquiao also ran for Congress. He tried to have a seat in, in General Santos City. Before then, he had several endorsements, 
for different products. But when he ran for that position, he had to discontinue those commercial endorsements. Now, he's again running, and you cannot see any endorsements for commercial products because Pacquiao is running for public office. The same with other candidates who might have had advertisements before they decided to run for public office. So that is a valid exercise of police power. When you go to the provinces, chances are you may have to utilize the NLEX and the SLEX. You may have noticed that there are no motorcycles in those tollways. And this is by virtue of the Limited Access Highway Act. In the case of Mirasol, the Supreme Court was confronted with the issue as to whether these restrictions on the owners of two-wheeled vehicles would be valid or not. The Supreme Court said yes. It's again a valid exercise of police power. It's intended to protect the public safety. You can already imagine what could possibly happen if a four-wheeled vehicle collided with a motorcycle in the expressways. In ordinary streets or roads, when these kinds of collisions happen, sometimes there are fatalities. How much more if this were to happen in, in tollways where speed is a general rule? So you could always possibly imagine the possibility of instantaneous death, not only for those riding the motorcycles, but even those who might be riding for wheeled vehicles. And the Supreme Court also said that the test of validity here is not whether it is the best recourse or remedy that could be resorted to. Instead, it's a question of asking yourself, is it reasonable or not? If it is reasonable, then it passes the test for valid exercise of police power. And there's also no need for scientific exactitude. Because if that were a requirement, the Supreme Court said, the government might not be able to implement any measure. Because it would always be spending time trying to conduct these scientific tests and the like. On world terrorism, you have, of course, the case of Social Justice Society versus Atienza. So this has something to do with the oil depot or the oil facilities of the big three oil companies in Pandahan. I assume that all of you are familiar with that place where you see all these big oil tanks. Following 9-11, the City Council of Manila passed an ordinance reclassifying that area from industrial to commercial. Because of that reclassification, it meant that those oil facilities would have to move out. So there was a timetable provided for, but in spite of the lapse of the period, the oil companies were still in that area. And the reason was, they and the mayor then, Atienza, were able to come up with a modus vivendi, extending their stay. So, Social Justice Society and some residents from that area filed a case before the Supreme Court trying to compel the mayor to comply with the ordinance. The Supreme Court said the mayor has to comply because that is the mandate of the ordinance. The mayor is supposed to be the one to execute and implement the ordinance. He cannot do otherwise. So in that case, the Supreme Court eventually said that the oil tanks would have to go. Now you might be wondering, if you pass by that area, that they're still there. 
So how did it happen when there's already a final Supreme Court decision? Well, after the finality of that decision, the City Council of Manila, this time now under Mayor Lin, passed an ordinance reclassifying that area from business to industrial. So with that reclassification, it is now again possible for those oil companies to maintain their facilities. So you might ask, could this not be contemptuous? There is already final judgment coming from the Supreme Court, and yet they are still made or allowed to stay in that place. You have to carefully remember that the decision of the Supreme Court is basically about the power of the Sangurian Panunzon of Manila to reclassify the area from industrial to commercial. The Supreme Court considered that as a valid exercise of police power. The city had the right to protect its citizens from the possibility of a terroristic attack, especially that these oil companies may be identified with Western interests. So the court upheld the power of the city to come up with this kind of classification. Theoretically, therefore, if the city can classify it from industrial to commercial, it can also have the power to revert to the older classification of industrial. So, it would not be directly contemptuous of the Supreme Court decision. Accordingly, if you are going now to assail the new ordinance, it should not be based on the fact that there was a prior Supreme Court decision. Instead, you have to find some other reason why that ordinance is invalid or unconstitutional. So you may have to refer to laws regarding, for instance, environment or some other grounds, but not based on the fact that there was an earlier Supreme Court decision. Regulation of devices is also part of the exercise of police power. The Supreme Court regulates the legal profession, and you would consider that as related to police power of the state. Professions may need to be regulated in order to protect the interests of the people. You cannot simply have professionals offering their services, and yet they are not regulated by the state. So what would now be the guarantee against malpractices? In the case of those engaged in radiologic technology or X-ray, you have this case of St. Luke's Medical Center. It used to be that those who are made to work in the radiologic or X-ray departments of hospitals or other establishments did not get a license. You just graduate from a course, perhaps it was considered more as a vocational course then, and then you could be employed by hospitals in the radiologic or X-ray department. Subsequently, however, Congress passed a law which required that radiologic technology be also subject to licensure examinations. By that time, St. Luke's had an employee who had been with its radiologic technology department since the 1980s. The employee was told to get an SRE government license, but she was unable to do it. So she was eventually discharged. So now you have an example of a conflict between two constitutionally guaranteed rights, security of tenure and the need to comply with 
so far as the hospital is concerned, with a police power measure, the requirement or a license to those who would be engaged or who would be employed in radiology departments. The Supreme Court tilted the balance in favor of the hospital. Even as the employee had the guarantee of security of tenure, the Supreme Court said this would have to give way to the higher interest to be subserved by the requirement that she obtain a license for her particular line of work in order that she would, she would be retained by the hospital. And since she did not do that, then the hospital was justified in doing away with her services. So that's the case of St. Luke's Medical Center. Still on health, we have that case of Beltran versus Secretary of Health, and which you could provide with the subtitle of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. So for those who might have been familiar with Winston Churchill, political science graduates or the history majors, assuming you still have some, you would remember Winston Churchill for his so-called blood, sweat, and tears speech at the height of World War II. He was trying to rally the English people to oppose and resist the Germans. Anyway, for the case of Beltran, you may adopt the same subtitle. Blood, sweat, and tears. Blood, because there's something to do with blood banks. Sweat, because it refers to commercial blood banks, in which case people would have to invest their money and their sweat in order that they can put up with this, or put up these blood banks. And tears, because they were told by the government to close shop. <laughs> Practical, right? In this case, before the passage of the law pro requiring the closure of the blood banks, there were four types of blood banks. One maintained by the government. Another one maintained by private hospitals. Another one not by the Red Cross. And finally, the so-called commercial or freestanding blood banks. There was a study which showed that if you got your blood, let's say for blood transfusion purposes, from the commercial blood banks, compared to getting your blood from the Philippine National Red Cross, there would be three times as likely occurrence of contracting AIDS, hepatitis B, malaria, or some other diseases. So it would appear that getting your blood from the commercial blood banks would be a health risk. Instead of getting better, you might get worse because you would now have these new ailments. So Congress eventually passed that law, which provided or required that the commercial blood banks would have to phase out. So why is that? Blood is blood, no matter where you get it, right? It's just like saying, perhaps, a guy is a guy, no matter where it comes from. But which is not true, right? There are differences between guys. So you have to have careful choices. Anyway, for, for blood, how would you explain the difference between that coming from the commercial blood banks and blood coming from the Philippine National Red Cross? Why would the quality be any different? There's a practical explanation to that. The Philippine National Red Cross obtains its blood from donations. The commercial blood banks buy the blood. So, how would that explain anything? 
if you are donating your blood, you will be more open and candid about your past, your history, correct? But if you were selling your blood, then you may try to be more quiet about your past. Why is that? When you're, you're, you're donating your blood, it doesn't really matter whether your blood is eventually obtained by the Red Cross or not. So if you donate your blood and then Red Cross undertakes certain screening processes and the Red Cross does not detect any problem, but you somehow would be giving them some information about your health history. And then the Red Cross would find out that there might be some problem with your blood. So the Red Cross would say, sorry, we cannot take your blood. To you, no problem. If you want it, you can have it. If not, it's okay. But if you were looking forward to selling your blood, then you would, you would rather keep quiet about your health history than say something and suffer the consequence of not being able to sell your blood. So if the screening process of the commercial blood banks would not be able to detect any problems, then you just keep quiet about what history you might have. And in that case, the commercial blood bank would now take your blood and pay you for that. But if you opened up and they also saw the problem with your health history, then that would mean that you would go home without the money that you've been looking forward to. So that would explain the difference in the quality between the blood maintained by commercial blood banks and the blood in the blood bank of the Philippine National Red Cross. And when you come to think of it, those who are selling their blood might be really more problematic. They might really be the people in need of money, and therefore you could really imagine the kind of life that they live, which could be more prone to, to problems in regard to their health. Like they might be those living in in slum areas and the like. So that could show a, a valid basis for the differentiation. And therefore, which could justify, again, the law, pursuant to police power, in requiring that blood banks of the commercial type would have to go. Still on health. When it comes to children, of course, you have that case of pharmaceutical and healthcare station of the Philippines. Still remember those times when you had those advertisements on TV regarding certain infant formula that if you nourish your children with a particular brand, you might just come up with geniuses. But it turns out that this is quite misleading, particularly because under the milk code, or executive order number 51, mother's milk is still the best. Therefore, it is supposed to be for the purpose of promoting breastfeeding. And that, the Supreme Court said, would be within the police power of the state to protect and promote the health of infants. From infancy, let's talk about Attorney Alcantara. <laughs> and soon to be Attorney Sandoval too. Senior citizens. When you, when you are an infant, you are helpless. So you need, normally, the assistance of parents or nannies. After that, you are on your own. You can very well do whatever you want, live your life as you desire, and then comes the time when you start sliding to the old age. So as you grow older, you might already be approaching also the end of your working days. You may have to retire. 
And after retirement, without gainful employment, you'll just be dependent on what pensions or retirement benefits you would have, or some other assistance from others. And also, as you grow older, you would also find that your body would start to show the signs of having been or having lived a fruitful life. The older you get, the more sickly you may start to become. But at that time, you would also now have less resources to pay for your medical and medicine needs. So here comes now the assistance extended by the state through the so-called senior citizens law. In the original provision of the law, drug stores would have to give a 20% discount to senior citizens whenever they buy medicine. So that would be a form of taking from the drug stores. The drug stores normally get, let's say, 1,000 pesos for a particular medicine. But if a senior citizen like attorney Alcantara would show up, then they would have to sell it to him only for 800 pesos. So in effect, the drug store would now be deprived of 200 pesos. But in the original provision of the law, that would be converted into a tax credit. And as a tax credit, which was the subject matter in the case of Central Zone Drug Corporation, there would be a one-is-to-one -one correspondence. Because at the end of the day, when the drugstore would have to pay its tax liability, it can make use of the tax credit to pay for the same. So for instance, at the end of the taxable year, the drugstore would have given the equivalent of 100,000 pesos by way of senior citizens discount. At the end of the year, it would also find out that it is liable to pay the government 150,000 as income tax. So what the drugstore would do would be to make use of the 100,000 pesos as tax credit as payment now for the income tax such that it would only have to shell out an additional amount of 50,000 pesos. So in effect, the drugstore would not have lost anything because it got the, or it got the full equivalent of what it gave by way of senior citizens discount. So in that case of Central Zone Drug Corporation, the Supreme Court said it represented the next, an exercise of, of the power of eminent domain and taxation. However, the law was subsequently changed such that instead of treating the senior citizens discount as tax credit, it was now to be treated as tax deduction or deduction for tax purposes. And in that way, the amount would not be equivalent to the full amount that was given by way of a senior citizen's discount. So instead of recovering the full amount of 100,000 pesos, it may happen that if you use the same for tax deduction purposes, it may only be equivalent to about 80,000 pesos. That would mean, therefore, that the drugstore would have lost 20,000 pesos. So is that still valid? Is the new senior citizen's law, which now treats the discount not as a tax credit, but as something to be used for tax deduction, is that valid? The Supreme Court said, in the case of Carlos Superdrug, that yes, it is. This time, it is no longer partaking of the nature of the exercise of the power of eminent domain. Instead, it's purely an exercise of police power. It is part of the police power of the state to require the better able members of society to help subsidize certain programs of the government that are intended to benefit some other sectors of society 
like seeking your citizens. Police power is normally associated with something that is beneficial, something that others may continue or may consider as virtues. How do you consider, for instance, smoking? That reminds of a Torres and Doval, right? <laughs> Is that a vice or a virtue? How about drinking? Again, something that you can identify with. Them. <laughs> or gambling. <laughs> like horse racing. <laughs> So are they vices or they are virtues? The main thing, they are just plain vices. Mm-hmm. And in a way, Buddhist power would somehow have an incidental effect of promoting them by allowing them. So how do you justify police power being used to advance what to others are vices. Well, you can look at it from a different perspective. They could be outlawed outright, but would that be effective? At the time when drinking was prohibited in the United States, you had this so-called practice of good legging. You prohibit smoking, it would still be there. Same way with gambling. In the case of gambling, for instance, you disallow or you prohibit gambling, you penalize it. Thank you. (laughs) Until I would have tasted it. (laughs) You prohibit gambling. You consider it a crime. Does that stop gambling? No. It only provides for some other means by which it could be continued, is it not? And worse, others would now be able to benefit from it. You have now, for instance, the protectors, the corrupt policemen and politicians and the like. And the money would be going to them. But if you regulate gambling, you would be able to generate so much funds that the government can use for its social amelioration programs. So you can see, for instance, the ambulances that are being donated by the PCSO to different local government units, and which sometimes are used by the local executives as their private vehicles. (laughs) So with regulated gambling, you can generate funds that the government can use for beneficial purposes in so far as the rest of society is concerned. And by regulating gambling also, then the government can specify the places and the conditions under which people can gamble instead of simply having this activity done in every street corner. The same thing could be said about smoking and drinking. So in the process, you allow it to a certain extent, but the government is also given the leeway to raise funds and therefore serve the needs of society while regulating an activity that needs to be carefully looked at. Police power, like the other fundamental powers of the state, are native to Congress. So they are supposed to belong to Congress. Congress, therefore, needs to delegate them in order that they could be exercised by any other officials of the land or other agencies. And normally, police power is delegated to the president, administrative bodies, and local government units. A very good example of an agency of the government that has not been granted police power 
would be the MMDA. So the MMDA cannot come up with its own ordinances. It has to rely on existing law or ordinances passed by the component cities and municipalities in order that it can implement the same. But on its own, it cannot. So you have that case of Garin, for instance, regarding the confiscation of driver's licenses. If there's no ordinance which allows for the same, then the MMDA cannot mm -hmm. just do that. Also the case of Bell Air. So in this regard, the Supreme Court has been consistent in saying that the MMDA does not have any police power because Congress never included that in the grant of its powers and prerogatives. In so far as the local government units are concerned, the same is contained in the so-called General Welfare Clause. It's now found in Section 16 of the Local Government Code. But being a mere delegated power, it must necessarily be subordinate to the exercise of powers by Congress. So, local government units cannot enact police power measures which would be contrary to the existing laws. So for that, you have the case again of Magtas regarding the opposition of Again, the Oro City, the establishment of a casino by PACCOR. The Supreme Court said PACCOR has a national charter which allows it to set up casinos nationwide. Therefore, a local government unit cannot oppose the same. How do you look at problems, just like the bar? Is that really a problem or it's something that you would rather welcome? something that you would embrace. The way you look at things may also affect the way by which you deal with them. Like, if you characterize a guy as handsome, then it would be easier for you to fall in love with him, right? Whereas if you start off with the characterization that he is ugly, then you would resent him no matter how kind, how intelligent, and how wealthy he might be. So in the same way, the way you look at the bar exams may somehow affect your preparation. If you think it's just a burden, then perhaps you may just be dragging your feet, just waiting for the time when you take the bar and start crying. Whereas if you take a look at the bar as an opportunity, then you would be more enthusiastic, you would be more than willing to do what it needs in order that you can prove yourself at the bar exams. So instead of thinking about the hardships, you would be thinking of how it would be after you would have seen your name in the internet the moment the Supreme Court releases the list. Do you think so? And then, that's the time that you would start crying. <laughs> crying or tears of joy. Correct? And perhaps that's the time also that you would start thinking of your other problems, like, when am I going to have a boyfriend? <laughs> So, learn a lesson or two from the case of Batangas CATV. And in this regard too, take note of how law relates to modern technology. Because normally, law cannot predict what would be the next technological advance or discoveries. Therefore, the laws may only be formulated after they would have realized, or the government would have realized, the problems brought about by new technology. But in the meantime, these developments keep on moving. So in Batangas CATV, the issue is about the power of Batangas City to prescribe subscriber rates for cable television. 
Matanga Say TV increased the subscriber rates without getting permission from the city. And the city said, you cannot do that. So the case went up all the way to the Supreme Court, and the issue was, is it within the power of the city or the national government? But what is more interesting to me is the opening paragraph of this case. Because here, the Supreme Court made reference to how community antenna television, more popularly known as cable television, came about. Perhaps for the younger generations, they might not really be in a position to appreciate what cable television has brought to their lives. If they don't, they don't know how it was before the advent of cable television. The time when there were only a few television stations in a particular locality. In Metro Manila, you would have channels 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. That's it. Now, you have so many, even channels whose language you cannot appreciate. <laughs> and during that time, television stations would sign in before lunchtime and would generally sign off towards midnight. Now, you can have programming on a 24-hour basis, 24-7. So if you cannot sleep, you can always watch. And before you realize it, you're already supposed to take the bar. <laughs> you're supposed to be studying, but you've been using your time to watch cable television. Sometimes I really admire and envy the newer generation for their discipline. How they would keep on track in their studies that it's sending all these distractions that they have. Is it? You have television programs that you can watch anytime you want. You have pirated DVDs. One is getting having how many movies? Twelve? Then you also have these campuses known as malls, right? <laughs> And this can remember when students used to stay in the library. Now that your libraries are Starbucks. <laughs> Expensive libraries. So in that opening paragraph of Batangas CA TV, the Supreme Court told the story of how cable television came about. In the late 1940s, there was this appliance dealer in Pennsylvania who was having a problem in so far as selling TV was concerned. Why? People were not buying television sets. So of course, if you are an appliance dealer, your interest is to sell. For some others, perhaps, if they were confronted with that kind of a problem, they might simply try to cry or forget about it, ignore it, or just fret about it. But for this guy, he decided to find out why people were not buying his television set. And soon enough, he realized the problem. The reception in that area was not good. So why would anybody buy a television set which would not be able to give you a good view of what's supposed to be shown. It would only be causing eye strain. If you want to buy, you would only have perhaps something to display in your living room area, but impractical. So given that realization, he thought of a brilliant idea. He built an antenna on top of a mountain and then connected his customers to that antenna by way of coaxial cable. And that, the Supreme Court said, gave birth to community antenna television or cable television. Now, you are the beneficiaries. So you can 
learn a lesson or two from that alone. Then the Supreme Court proceeded to discuss the problem about regulation of cable television in the local areas. The Supreme Court said cable television is new technology. As of now, it is regulated by the national government through the National Telecommunications Commission. Therefore, it is not within the power of the local government units to grant franchises or to regulate the fees, the subscriber rates that may be charged by these cable operators. Accordingly, Batanga CATV had no right to stop Batanga CATV or Batanga City had no right to stop Batanga CATV from raising its rates. This is only subject to regulation by the national government through the NTC. Does that mean, therefore, that the local government units should be helpless when it comes to these cable operations? The Supreme Court said that's not necessarily, because for some of the exercise of police power, they may still be able to regulate the physical facilities of these companies, like when they lay out their cables across streets or under streets, then that is something that the local government units can properly regulate. Take note that this case also had a beneficial effect when it came to another case which was entirely unrelated. That's the case of Zomzak versus People. This is about the prosecution under the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. Because in this case, the accused were charged with having allegedly given undue advantage to one cable operator to the prejudice of another cable operator. So how did the case of Batanga CATV come to the aid of the accused? The Supreme Court explained that in Batanga CATV, it held that the local government units have no right to regulate operations of cable television, because this is under the auspices of the national government. So. If that is the case, they cannot give franchises. If they have no authority to grant franchises, then it necessarily follows that they cannot possibly favor one as against any other cable operator. Because it was not within their power to favor anyone. They had no authority to grant franchises. So you can see how it benefited another set of people. And did you ever notice how legal research is just like the internet? Hyperlinking? You see, or you read a case, then you might be referred to another case. And when you read that other case, you may then be referred to other cases and so on. So, it's just like what you do in your virtual world. It's just a little more serious, right? At least for now. After that, while waiting for the results of the bar, then perhaps you may spend hours and nights tending to your Facebook. <laughs> Uploading videos in YouTube, right? In uh, Lucena Central Grand Terminal, Lucena City tried to solve its traffic problems in the city proper. So what it did was to come up with a so-called Grand Central Terminal at the outskirts of the city. This meant that provincial buses would no longer be allowed to go to the city proper. Instead, they would load and unload their passengers at this central terminal. 
And these passengers in turn would then be transported from the central terminal to the city proper. The problem with this is that Jack Liner maintained a terminal in city proper. With this ordinance in place, it would mean that it would no longer be able to use its terminal in the city proper. So it went to court, and the Supreme Court sustained it. The Supreme Court said what the city did in this case somehow partook of overbreath. Why? While the city has every right to see to it that the traffic problem would be somehow minimized, still it must not undertake measures which would sweep too broadly. Here the Supreme Court observed that the traffic problem had been caused by the indiscriminate loading and loading of passengers in the city proper. But the court said there is no showing that it is the presence of the bus terminals that contributed to the traffic problem. So if the bus terminals had nothing to do with the problem, why should they be included in the solution? Accordingly, the Supreme Court said that ordinance is invalid. Now let's talk about eminent domain. We just discussed eminent domain here in passing relative to a general discussion on the fundamental powers of the state. There's a simple way by which you can appreciate eminent domain. And you can relate it to personal relationships. By the way, what is it now? Is it the woman's world or a man's world still? Woman's world. So if a woman is interested in a guy, the normal way by which that woman can get him is to court him, right? <laughs> the same way, when the government is interested in a particular property, the normal way to acquire it is to negotiate for it. If the owner refuses to sell, but the government really needs it for a public purpose, then it may use its power of eminent domain to compel or coerce that unwilling owner to part with this property, subject only to that condition that there be payment of just compensation. But in so far as the woman interested in the guy who is not as mutually interested in her is concerned, there is no counterpart anymore. Otherwise, if she tries to force himself or herself on him, then that might be what? Great coercion? <laughs> it's already a crime. So in interpersonal relationship, it may be a crime. But when it comes to the government exercising its power of eminent domain, that is perfectly legal and valid. In the old case of Quezon City versus Erecta, the Supreme Court highlighted the difference between eminent domain and police power insofar as that act of taking is concerned. So if you remember the case of Erecta, Quezon City has this ordinance which required private cemetery owners to set aside 6% of their areas for the burial of paupers. In blind Filipino has such a memorial park in Quezon City and it assailed the constitutionality of that ordinance. The city said it's a valid exercise of police power. In blind said no, that's an invalid exercise of the power of eminent domain. So how do you know whether it's police power or eminent domain? Because in both instances, there may be taking of property. The Supreme Court said taking under police power makes that the property which is otherwise dangerous or noxious is taken by the government for the purpose of having it condemned or destroyed. That's to protect the interest of the public. On the other hand, taking under eminent domain means that the property that is useful is taken by the government for the purpose of serving the interests of the public. 
a cemetery lot cannot be considered as noxious. It is something useful. As a matter of fact, the city would use it for the purpose of burying paupers. So in that case, if the city wanted to take that kind of property, it should have to pay just compensation. Or, if it does not want to pay just compensation, then it would just have to set up its own cemetery. In the case of Agan versus Piatko, we have here that the agreement between the government and Piatko for the construction on a build operate transfer basis of the Naia Terminal 3. As you are well aware of, that agreement has been invalidated by the Supreme Court for violation of several provisions of existing law. Anyway, in that case, the Supreme Court note, noted a particular provision which provided that in case the government shall temporarily take over the terminal in times of national emergency, that would be pursuant to Section 17, Article 12 of the Constitution, then the government would have to pay just compensation. Anything wrong with that? The Supreme Court said it is unconstitutional. When the government temporarily takes over in times of national emergency, it exercises its police power. It's different from what is provided for in Section 18, because here there is now a transfer of ownership, whereas in temporary takeover, there is only a temporary transfer of possession, so that the government can operate as a public utility or business affected with public interest because of the exigencies of the public emergency. Since there is no permanent transfer, then there is no need to pay just compensation. That's the case of Agan versus Piazmo. Now when it comes to the power of taxation, we are all familiar with that old line that the power to tax is a power to destroy. At the same time, we are also familiar with the other line that goes hand in hand with that, where the U.S. Supreme Court said that the power to tax shall not be the power to destroy for as long as the court sits. Anyway, taxation is something that people would try to avoid as much as they can. But even as taxation may be considered as among the fundamental powers of the state, still it cannot be used arbitrarily. So you have that old case of Reyes versus Almanzor. In that case, Reyes owned several lands that he rented out to tenants. Then there came a new assessment coming from the city treasurer of Manila. And Reyes realized that under the new assessment, he would be paying real estate taxes greater than the income that he would be deriving from his property. So for instance, he may be getting an income of 1,000 pesos a month, or let's say 10,000 pesos a year, but he would be made to pay 11,000 in real estate taxes. So that's obviously unfair. So he went to court and questioned the validity of that kind of real estate taxation. Because what the city did was to make use of the comparable sales approach. The Supreme Court said it would be unfair. It would be confiscatory. You cannot equate a property that is covered by the free rental law with some other properties, even if they're just next to that property, which are not similarly covered. Because obviously, those properties which are not covered by the free rental law would fetch 
a higher price in the market compared to those that are covered by the free spread alone. Accordingly, you may assess those properties not covered by the free spread alone in accordance with the comparable sales approach. But when it comes to those properties covered by the free spread alone, then follow the income approach. That would be more just and fair. In regard to taxation, it used to be that it was entirely dependent on Congress whether to delegate the same to local government units or not. But under the 1987 Constitution, this is now directly delegated by the Constitution, subject to such restrictions and guidelines as Congress may set out. So what does this mean? In the case of buy and sell, Quezon City tried to impose real estate taxes on the properties of Biontel. But Biontel claimed that under its charter, it was exempt from such taxes. The Supreme Court sustained Biontel. The Supreme Court said it is within the power of Congress to withhold or to exempt certain properties from the taxing authority of the local government units. While it is true that the local government units have already been delegated the taxing power pursuant to the Constitution, still it is within the power of control of Congress to determine the extent of the taxing authority of the local government units. So Congress may pass a law which would accept certain properties from the ability of local government units to tax. In Yamane versus B.A. Lepanto Corporation, Condominium Corporation, the Supreme Court said that as a general rule, or condominium corporations are not subject to business taxes. These business taxes are imposed in regard to the ability of certain corporations to earn profit. But whatever dues or fees may be collected by the business or by the condominium corporations are not really intended to generate profit. Instead, they will be needed more for the upkeep of the condominium units. So as a general rule, they are not subject to the imposition of business taxes. And here, the Supreme Court also said that since taxation would represent a form of the deprivation of property, then the authorities must be able to clearly inform the taxpayers as to the basis for the imposition of taxes. Here, the city treasurer of Makati tried to justify the imposition of the taxes by saying that it is based on the standard of full appreciative living values. The Supreme Court said, what's that? It's not capable of a ready explanation under the English language. It's not capable of legal explication, and it does not even have a meaning in Google. So if that's the case, then obviously taxpayers would be at a loss to understand what's the basis for the imposition of the tax. In the more recent case of Philippine health care providers, the Supreme Court said that the state should not try to impose taxes that would practically bleed dry corporations. While corporations are subject to tax, the same must also be tempered by the realization that they need to earn and be living, or at least be able to sustain themselves. So if you impose too many taxes or too high a tax on business corporations, then they may be forced out of that undertaking. And that would be somehow also violating of the guarantee of due process. 
generally, these fundamental powers are stand-alone powers. Meaning, they may just be utilized individually. If it's police power, then it's police power. Eminent domain, eminent domain. Taxation, simply use taxation or power of taxation. But there are times when they also hold hands and move together towards the same direction. Or romantic. How is that possible? Well, at times it's not enough that you only have one power. You may need the cooperation of some other powers. And what better way to illustrate this by a case that you must also have met in your first year. Ermita Malate Hotel and Hotel Operators Inc. Those are places where romances are consummated. So to the city of Manila, these establishments were not or are not really considered as that desirable. Because they may have adverse consequences insofar as the idea of good morality is concerned. So Manila thought of a way by which it can regulate them more, making access to these facilities less desirable or more costly. It provided, for instance, for registration in a place that is open to the public gates. Such an idea of that kind of establishment, where you are now exposed to the public as you enter. And then there was also a requirement that the room should not be rented out more than twice in a day. At the same time, the license fees would be much higher. So in so far as regulating how access to the establishments is concerned, that would be an exercise of police power. And normally, license fees would also be considered as part of the exercise of police power because they are needed for the regulation of certain establishments. But the fee that is to be charged should only be equivalent to cover the cost of regulation. So if the cost of regulation, let's say, is 1000 then the license fee should be 1000 that would be in accordance with the exercise of police power. However, if the fee would be much higher than the cost of the regulation, then it would no longer be considered as part of the exercise of police power. It would now be considered as part of the power of taxation. So in this case, the Supreme Court said the power of taxation came to the assistance of police power for the purpose of carrying out a policy or a program of the city of Manila designed to promote the good morality of the inhabitants of the city. So if it's made difficult for you to go to any of the establishments in Manila, of course you would always go somewhere else, right? Like Pasay, Pasay, Kaluoka. Anyway, that illustrates the cooperation between police power and the power of taxation. When it comes to police power and eminent domain, you have the example of the comprehensive agrarian reform program of the government. So, to the extent that the government would have to limit the maximum area of land holdings, let's say five hectares, it would mean that the government would now be taking the excess and, then, and the excess would then be redistributed to the serving citizens. So that would partake of 
police power. But the government cannot simply take property without paying. It cannot just confiscate. So it would have to pay just compensation. And in that case, you now have cooperation between police power and power of eminent domain. In so far as eminent domain and taxation is concerned, we already have discussed earlier the case of Central Luzon Drug Corporation regarding the senior citizen's law. So, when the government requires the giving of a senior citizen's discount in the month, or equivalent to 20%, that is taking. But compensation, which is considered as just, because it is full amount, it would come through the power of taxation by granting tax credit. Now we are done with the fundamental powers of the state. We talk about the counterweight, the Bill of Rights. You would appreciate the Bill of Rights better if you realize that it is directed at the government. So it is the counterweight to the vast powers that the government has. If you have a problem with your neighbor, you cannot invoke the Bill of Rights because your neighbor is not the government. Instead, you would have to look elsewhere for other appropriate laws that you can use against your neighbor if you can still wait. Otherwise, you would just solve it on your own. In that old case of People v. Humanity, this principle was illustrated. Marty wanted certain packages to be delivered to his, to his friend in Switzerland. And for that purpose, he made use of the services of a private forwarding company. The proprietor of that company wanted to open the packages at a time when Marty was still around. But Marty said, no need, he said, just books and cigars. So the proprietor did not insist. But when Marty was already out, the proprietor opened the packages pursuant to standard operating procedure before they would be sent to custom. The proprietor found that instead of cigars, the packages contained marijuana. So Marty was prosecuted and he claimed before the Supreme Court that there was a violation of his right against unreasonable searches. The Supreme Court said you cannot invoke the provision of the Bill of Rights against unreasonable searches because the person who was involved in this case, the one who opened your packages, is not a government personality. He is a private person. In the case of People v. Hippol, Hippol was an employee at the treasurer's office in Baguio. His job was to deposit the daily collections in the bank. One day, he was absent and a co-employee of his, I think a utility worker, was asked to look into his drawer for certain documents. In the process of looking for those documents, that co-employee chanced upon certain deposit slips representing amounts which obviously were not deposited by Hippol. So he was subsequently charged criminally for pocketing the money. And he claimed again that there was a violation of his right against unreasonable searches and seizures. The Supreme Court said that provision is directed at police authorities or the law enforcement arm of the government. In so far as your fellow employee is concerned, he's just a private person. Therefore, you cannot invoke that guarantee. In the case of Bongkarawan, Bongkarawan was a passenger in the super ferry. 
that a fellow passenger complained with security personnel that her jewelry was missing. And she suspected Bong Karawan as the one who got her jewelry. So the security personnel look, looked for him, they found him, and they searched his luggage. They did not find jewelry, instead they found drugs, and for which he was prosecuted. Before the Supreme Court, Bong Karawan claimed that there was a violation also of his right against unreasonable searches. But perhaps he had learned somehow from the case of Marty, and so he tried to give a better explanation why he thought the provision against unreasonable searches and seizures should apply. According to him, the security personnel of the super ferry are armed, just like policemen. So just like policemen who are governed by the provision against unreasonable searches and seizures, the security personnel should also be subject to the provisions of this provision of the <clears throat> Bill of Rights. The Supreme Court said, even as security personnel of the super ferry are armed, just like policemen, still they are considered as private persons, and therefore you cannot use the provision of the Constitution against unreasonable searches and seizures against them. So the Supreme Court said they are still considered as private persons. From ships, let's now go to a plane. I assume that most of you have already flown in planes. So you would have a better idea how you can visualize how a plane and its seats are arranged. In the case of Ira Swaggy, he was a flight steward or a cabin crew. For employees of that nature, there is a weight limit. Just like when you ride a plane, there's also a limit in the weight of your baggage. If you exceed the limit, then you pay. In the case of the employee, he was supposed to have a maximum weight of around 160 pounds. However, just like many bar reviewers, they tend to balloon while reviewing. So instead of maintaining his weight at 160, he grew to be more than 200 pounds. And Philippine Airlines said, shape up. He was given time to reduce. After several months, it was still a hopeless proposition. So, Fal eventually said, sorry, but you have to go. He filed a case for legal dismissal, but the Supreme Court found that there was a valid basis for his dismissal relative to his position as a flight steward. The Supreme Court explained that that requirement is intrinsically tied down to his job as a flight steward. Because such employees are not only or not even primarily for the purpose of serving food to the passengers. More importantly, they should be in such a state of health that they could readily move in times of emergency. They could assist the passengers in orderly exiting the plane or at least assisting them to do what is necessary. The Supreme Court said, you have to remember that the aisle of planes is narrow. So you cannot configure the plane just to accommodate these kinds of flight crew. Otherwise, in times of emergency, 
they might just constitute a what? Blockade? <laughs> <laughs> so the board said there is a valid basis for dismissing it for failure to abide by the weight limit. In this particular case, Irasuegi made use of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution to assail the action of the, of the airline in dismissing him because of that problem, when, according to him, there were others who also had that kind of a problem, but they were not dismissed. As a matter of fact, they were reassigned to some other positions in power. The Supreme Court said, well, there's, not, there's no evidence. You have not come up with details as to your specification or your charges that others were treated differently from you. And even assuming that they were treated in a manner different from how you were treated by PAL, still you cannot invoke the Equal Protection Clause because, as you remember, the Equal Protection Clause is part of the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights can only be invoked against acts or agencies and instrumentalities of the government. Philippine Airlines is a private business concern. Therefore, you cannot properly invoke the Bill of Rights as against PAL. Now let's go back to 1986. It must have been around, what, 10 years old then? Oh, sorry, it should be 15. So in 1986, we had the so-called Elsa Revolution. Mark left Malanganyang and Cory Aquino took over. With the departure of Marcos, some other high government officials also had to step down. One of them was General Joseph Ramas, who was the commanding general of the Philippine Army then. In the first week of March, 1986, the search warrant was applied for to four illegal firearms and ammunition. And this was served in the residence of a girlfriend of General Ramas. When the search was done, And after the searching party was able to get what it was looking for, it not only came up with guns and ammunition, but also cash, both peso and dollars, jewelry, land titles, and radio equipment. So these were not included in the search warrant, since the search warrant was only for and licensed firearms and ammunition. And perhaps a sign of the times, government service is a good opportunity to get rich, right? So eventually, General Ramas and his girlfriend were charged before the Sandigan Bayan by the PCGG relative to unexplained wealth. The Sandigan Bayan eventually dismissed the case without prejudice, saying that the, the PCGG was not the proper authority to prosecute the case against General Ramas and his girlfriend. Because General Ramas did not appear to be closely connected or related to Marcos, or that he owed his position because of special considerations from Marcos. So since he was ordinarily high in the government structure, without any possible connection to Marcos, then the matter should be prosecuted by the Ombudsman, not the PCTG. Accordingly, 
Supreme or the Sandian Bayan said the case is dismissed without prejudice to the Ombudsman filing the appropriate case. But at the same time, the Sandigan Bayan also said in its decision that those articles, the cash, the jewelry, the land titles, and the radio equipment, which were confiscated by the raiding team, should be returned to Ramas and his girlfriend. So the case was elevated to the Supreme Court, and the government claimed that the Sandigan Bayan heard. What is only of relevance to us is the argument of the government relative to the application of the exclusionary rule. Because if you see, the Sandigan Bayan based its order to return those items on the exclusionary rule. So why should there be a debate about the exclusionary rule? The government argued that during the time of the search, we had no constitution. And if there was no constitution, there would have been no Bill of Rights. And if there was no Bill of Rights, there would have been no exclusionary rule. Quite logical, isn't it? But you, by now, you're already fourth year, or you're past fourth year, you're graduates, you want to take the bar. You would have realized that the law does not necessarily have to follow logic. The Supreme Court said, we agree with you, that during that time, we had no constitution. But we don't agree with the conclusion that you derived thereby. So why was there no constitution? Because we had a successful revolution. A successful revolution necessarily meant that if it succeeded, the old existing order would have to be repudiated. The coming to power by Cory Aquino was not by virtue of the 1973 constitution. Because that constitution led to the proclamation of Marcos. So if you follow the constitution, Marcos would have been the president. But since Marcos was successfully overthrown, it also meant that the legal order under which Marcos was the president was automatically abrogated or repudiated. So from that period when Cory took over until the time when a new original constitution, the Freedom Constitution, was promulgated on March 25, the Philippines had no constitution. So that's the period referred to as the Interregnum. So there was no constitution. How then could you still make use of the so-called exclusionary rule? The Supreme Court explained, even as we repudiated the 1973 constitution, we did not similarly turn our back on our international commitments. We are a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. These international instruments carry the same protection as that of the exclusionary rule under the 1973 constitution. Therefore, even as there was no constitution, we are still bound to follow this rule by virtue of our adherence to these international instruments. So that's the case of Republic versus Sandigan Bayan regarding the presence of the exclusionary rule during the so-called Interregnum. Now let's proceed to the due process clause. If you 
go through the language of the provision itself. It's just a very general statement. So we would have to find meaning from its application. Due process would mean basically fairness, reasonableness. Due process would mean acting in accordance with the law. But this is also problematic because even the law itself would be declared to be unconstitutional. So we have to again go through the different aspects of the due process clause. It speaks of person. And that could refer to a, an individual or a juridical person. It could also refer to citizens as well as aliens. But this early, take note already of the relativity of due process. You may make use of the same term or expression over and over again, but it means differently when applied to different persons. Like, you may have love for a boyfriend, love for a parent, love for siblings. Yeah? It's all love that you're using, but that word means differently depending on who you are addressing it to. Yeah? So the same way when it comes to due process. Due process as applied to natural persons would not be the same as due process as applied to juridical persons. Natural persons are given more compared to juridical persons. So, something that might already suffice when applied to a juridical person would not be enough when applied to a natural person. Why is that? You have to remember that we are in a Republican state. So it resides in the people and all government authority emanates from them. So, in a Republican state, the state serves the people. The people are not mere slaves to the state. Therefore, it is their interest, not that of the state, that should be our primary concern. Individuals are not creatures of the state. On the other hand, juridical persons are merely creatures of the state. They would not have any legal existence if the state did not recognize them as such. Therefore, they could be subjected to greater regulation compared to, to individuals. Would you ever think of the state requiring, for instance, individuals to submit a yearly report of what they did? On the other hand, it's normally the case that juridical persons must submit a, a report as to what they did the prior year. Submissions to the Securities and Exchange Commission. When it comes to aliens vis-a-vis -vis citizens, again, there is relativity. Citizens may be subjected to certain regulations, which when applied to citizens, or aliens may be subjected to certain regulations, which when applied to, to citizens may be considered as unconstitutional. Again, it's because of the difference between citizens and aliens. Citizens are those precisely who are supposed to be the source of governmental power, whereas aliens are merely guests. Therefore, they will be subjected to greater 
regulation compared to citizens. How about a fetus? It's not considered as a person under the due process clause of the Constitution. In that controversial case in the United States, Roe versus Wade, the United States Supreme Court had occasion to rule on the issue as to whether a fetus is a person under the due process clause or not. Roe versus Wade has something to do with right to abortion. There were laws in the states before which penalized abortion unless covered by the exceptions. Pro, that's a pseudonym, questioned the constitutionality of one such law. She claimed that it's part of her liberty as a woman to choose what to do with her body, including what's in it. And the Supreme Court sustained her. The Supreme Court said that it is part of the right of a woman to choose for herself what to do with her body, such that if she thinks that an unwanted fetus should be expelled or aborted, then she should be given the right to do that. In that case, the U.S. Supreme Court divided a woman's pregnancy into three periods of four months each. That's what you were not listening. One way by which I could determine whether you're still listening or not is to sometimes mistake you. So that should be three by three, right? That's nine months. During the first term, the woman would have a perfect right to have an abortion as she would have wanted to, subject only to consultations that she would have with her physician. During the second trimester, the states may pass certain legislation intended to protect the woman relative to her health, so that while she may still have an abortion, the state may provide certain regulations in order to protect the woman. So you can see there's still the right of the woman to have an abortion, but the state may step in to protect her health, not to prevent her from having an abortion, but to ensure that if she does have one, it would not imperil her health. And during the third trimester, the woman would still have the right to abort if she wanted to. However, the state may now pass legislation intended to protect the life of the unborn if capable of living after it has been delivered. So if there's still no chance that that unborn would live if delivered, then the woman would still have the right to abort. So if that's the way the Supreme Court considered the right of a woman relative to abortion, is the fetus a person under the Due Process Clause or not? The Supreme Court said the fetus is not a person under the Due Process Clause. Because if it said that the fetus is a person, then there would be a problem. How would you now expel a fetus when you would not get hurt? So there would be a problem. In this case, the Supreme Court said it is not a person under the Due Process Clause. How did the Supreme Court arrive at that conclusion? The Supreme Court surveyed the use of the word person in the U.S. Constitution, and it found that invariably whenever the word person is used, it refers to someone who has already been born. So 
obviously a Philos has not yet been born. Therefore, he would not be considered as a person under the due process clause. In any event, in so far as the Philippines is concerned, you have in Article 2, Section 12, a provision there which mandates the state to protect the life of the mother and the unborn from conception. Perhaps this was to make sure that the Philippines would not follow the lead of Raw versus Wade. And if you are wondering why it was not in the 1973 Constitution, the reason might be because Roe versus Wade was only decided in 1973. Regarding the protection to afforded to life and liberty, you have to realize that this is not merely a matter of physical existence. You have to have the ability to make use of your life in a meaningful manner. Try to imagine yourself being alive, but you are just told to stay in a room. You cannot go out. You can watch television as much as you want, but you cannot even have a chance to be with your friends. Worse, you are not allowed to have a cell phone. <laughs> Would that life be worth living? So to be alive is not simply a matter of being in existence. There are certain things that you can do with your life. Like go out, see places, fall in love, and fall out of love every now and then. Cry, laugh, go crazy every now and then too, right? <laughs> And for some, it's normal for them to get depressed, isn't it? Especially for the women, because that's an excuse for them to go shopping. <laughs> if there's anybody willing to pick it up.
become that of a male, and that to her she is now more male than female, then she has the right to have a correction in her birth certificate. Of course, it is to be contrasted from the case of Silverius, remember? He was born into a male body, but in time, he realized that his emotions were those of the opposite sex. He would fall in love with another man. And he wanted to have the experience, perhaps, more realistic. So, what she did was to go to Bangkok and have a sex reassignment operation. Sex change. Therefore, she had, or he had his body physically altered. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> Perhaps they just came up with some semblance of being a female by removing some of the features of the male anatomy and substituting it with the features of what would pass off as female anatomy. So after that operation, she came back to the Philippines and wanted to have a correction also in his birth certificate. This time, he wanted now his birth certificate to reflect that he was female and that his name should now be that of a female too. The Supreme Court said, sorry, but even as we consider it with you, we cannot grant your request. Because presently there is no law that allows that kind of a correction in birth certificate simply because of sex reassignment operation or sex change operation. You are barking at the wrong tree. If you want relief, then you have to go first to Congress in order that the appropriate law may be passed. Perhaps he would have better chances if Lad Lad would be able to get a seat in <laughs> Congress. Right? When you have some superior talents, expertise, or qualifications, that would make you feel good, right? So here we have the case of Jay Sonza. Is running again for senator? Vice President. <laughs> anyway, you still remember him? He and Mel used to be with ABS-CBN. Do you remember that? Yes. Then there was a falling out, and they got out of ABS-CBN and eventually stayed with GMA. Now, Jay is known as Joey, is that? <laughs> when Jay Sonsa left ABS-CBN, there were still unresolved issues between him and the network. So what he did was to file a case against ABS-CBN before the labor arbiter. He was claiming that ABS-CBN still owed him certain amounts. When the case against the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, Jay Sonsa has special skills, expertise, and talent. It's nice to hear those words said about you, right? Until he realized that they were just preparatory to telling him that his case fails. Why is that? The Supreme Court said, if a person has these kinds of qualities, then it is part of his liberty that he should be able to make use of them, not just like those of ordinary individuals. For ordinary individuals, they just get employed. Perhaps they might not be able to, to negotiate with their employer. They may only have to take it or leave it. But in the case of Jay Sonsa, considering his qualifications, then he had the ability to negotiate with ABS-CBN. And in that 
he negotiated not as an employee, but as an independent contractor. Because of his qualities, it was his right to make use of the same, unlike ordinary individuals. And in that regard, he entered into a relationship with ABS-CBN, not as an employee, but as an independent contractor. So how did that work to his disadvantage? The Supreme Court said, you filed your case in the wrong forum. So this should be also a lesson for you. If you are overqualified, chances are your prospective employers would reject you. Or at least, whenever you get rejected, who do we say it's because I was overqualified? <laughs> In regard to property, we have some problem areas here, particularly with licenses or privileges and public office. Public office, as you very well know, is not considered as property. It is of public trust. But in the Philippines, of course, public office has become hereditary. So it's not public, or it's not property in the sense that if ever the incumbent is removed, or the office is abolished, then you would have no right to complain about having been deprived of a property. However, if he is entitled to security of tenure, and he is unceremoniously ousted or kicked out from office, then he may have reason to complain and avail of due process, because the guarantee of security of tenure partakes of the nature of property for that limited purpose. But if the position is abolished, and it is pursuant to a bona fide act of Congress, for instance, there is no bad faith, then he cannot complain about having been deprived of property. In the case of Velez v. Rivera, regarding the position of Executive Vice President for the IBP, the Supreme Court also said that that kind of position cannot be considered as property. So in that case, the incumbent then, Tony Rivera, even as he was the Executive Vice President, and as such was supposed to take over the position of President in time, the Supreme Court said he had no vested right to that position, and therefore he could be ousted by the IBP Board of Governors if they had the numbers, and they had the valid reason for his removal from office. Insofar as the right privilege economy is concerned, it has something to do with the general rule that if a person is simply claiming based on a privilege, like a license, then normally the courts would not grant him any relief if this privilege is now withheld from him. However, take note of what the Supreme Court said in the case of Terminal Facilities and Services Corporation, that the right privilege economy had come to an end when the courts realized that the fate of the citizens could not just be left to the arbitrary whims and caprices of those in the government to withhold certain privileges that they had given in the past. So if those in charge of granting these privileges, these licenses, suddenly withhold the same from the citizens for no apparently valid reason, then the courts may come in and afford relief to those affected citizens. In the case of Board of Medicine v. OTA, 
we have here a situation where a Japanese was allowed to enroll in a college of medicine in the Philippines. You very well know that the Philippines, the practice of profession, is supposed to be limited to citizens, except when otherwise allowed by law. Medicine is one such profession. So Ota was able to finish his medical course in the Philippines. Then he took the board exam. He passed. He applied for a license and complied with the requirement of the law that he proved that there is reciprocity between his country, Japan, and the Philippines. That in Japan, aliens like Filipinos are allowed to practice medicine. Still, the Board of Medicine and the Professional Regulation Commission refused to give him the license, saying that even as there is proof that Filipino doctors may practice in Japan, it appears that it will be practically impossible because of the language barrier. So the law may allow Filipinos to practice, but they will not really be able to practice because it would be impossible for them because of the problem with Japanese language. So it refused to grant. The case went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, here there is grave abuse of discretion on the part of the administrative agency that was given discretion to grant or withhold the medical license. The grant of a discretion does not necessarily mean that it can be exercised in an arbitrary or whimsical manner. The law here simply requires that there is proof of reciprocity. OTA was able to comply with the law. Therefore, it was not right on the part of the Board of Medicine and the Professional Regulation Commission to still withhold that license simply on that alleged ground that it would be practically impossible for a Filipino to practice in Japan. That is not a requirement in the law, and the administrative agencies must not add that to the requirements. So that's the case of Board of Medicine versus OTA. The Due Process Clause protects life, liberty, and property. What happens when there is a conflict among these values of society? For that, we have the old case of Philippine Blooming Mills. In that case, workers of Philippine Blooming Mills advised their employer that they would be joining a rally in front of the Panayan. Now you might be wondering, how could that be possible? Because you are now thinking about contemporary times. But this happened in the 70s yet. So at that time, rallies were still allowed in front of the Panayan. Philippine Blooming Mills advised the workers that those whose shift would be affected by the proposed rally should not attend in order not to disrupt the operations of Philippine Blooming Mills. The workers still went full force and therefore the operations of Philippine Blooming Mills were disrupted for that day. When they went back to work, their leaders and some of them were disciplined. Some were dismissed. The case went up all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said there is a hierarchy of rights. Human rights prevail over property rights. Here what is involved is the right of the workers to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. 
they are particularly assailing alleged police brutality of the passing police. So it has nothing to do with the employer. On the other hand, what is sought to be asserted by the employer is its right to property, particularly profit. So by the exercise of the employees of their right to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances, they then affected the ability of their employer to realize profit. But the Supreme Court said the property rights should be subordinate to the human rights because human rights are considered more important in society. The court explained, for instance, that when it comes to prescription, property rights prescribe, but human rights do not. When it comes to the validity of laws, it's enough that there is a rational connection between what is sought to be accomplished and the means for doing that if you're only dealing with property rights. But when it comes to human rights, a higher standard is required. The presence of a clear and substantive injury that's likely to happen if not abated. So here, you're trying to match human rights with property rights. Since the property rights should be subordinate to the human rights, then disciplinary sanctions imposed on the employees for exercising their human rights would not be upheld. And related to the hierarchy of rights would be the so-called standards of review. The standards of review are just like yardsticks that the courts use for the purpose of determining the validity of laws or regulations that affect the rights of the people. Depending on which rights, liberties, or freedoms are affected, to that extent, would there be a change of standards to be used? To make it easier for you to appreciate regarding these standards of review, let's go back to your school days. You very well remember that during your school days, you had subjects with different number of units. Some may have had one or two units. Others may have had four or even five. But the degree of dedication, the effort that you had to invest in studying was not dictated by the number of units, is it not? It was dictated by the kind of professors you had. So it's as if your professors would be the standards of the need for you to study. If your professor, even if he was just handling a subject with two units, happened to be a member of Al-Qaeda, then you would have to study well in order that you would not be blasted out of the room every time you attend these classes. But if a subject, let's say, is five units, but your professor happens to have been an angel and who didn't bother to ask you to do more than be present in class, then chances are you would not also be studying well. You would just have a passing glance of the book if ever you touched it. So that may be a simplified way of explaining the standards or the standards of review. The more important a freedom is to society, the higher the standard used by the courts. Or just like you are dealing with friends. For friends who are just passing acquaintances, you don't really care whether they like you or not. But for others to whom you are close, it would really matter a lot the moment you notice that they are not talking to you. So 
it's because of the relationship that you have with them. So we have the so-called rational or differential standard of review. Then you would have the intermediate standard, and finally strict scrutiny. When courts are simply dealing with laws, which affect, for instance, property or economic rights, then they make use of the so-called rational basis or differential standard of review. So under this standard, it's enough that there is a rational connection between what is sought to be accomplished and the means adopted by the law for that purpose. There's even no need for the courts to look into the substantiality of the government interest asserted. When it comes to intermediate standard or heightened scrutiny, then the courts would try to find whether there is a substantial basis or interest of the state to be subserved by a law. And they would also try to find out if there would be some other alternative means to accomplish what the law is trying to come up with. So this may happen, for instance, in regard to content neutral regulations or when it comes to classifications based on legitimacy. There is a higher degree of scrutiny that is then used by the courts. But when you're now dealing with those very important values to society, like freedom of speech or freedom of religion, then the courts would make use of strict scrutiny. So under strict scrutiny, it's not enough that there is a substantial government interest. There must be a compelling state interest that would justify the impairment or the restrictions on the freedom of religion or freedom of speech. And there should be no other means to accomplish what the government wants to do. The more frequent discussions by the court of these standards, I think, started with the separate opinion of Justice Mendoza in the case of Estrada versus Sandigan Bayan. Then in subsequent, in subsequent cases, the Supreme Court had more extensive discussions on these standards, such as in the case of Central Bank Employees Association versus Bank Central ng Filipinas. In White Light Corporation, the Supreme Court also started talking about strict scrutiny to be utilized for the purpose of determining whether the ordinance in issue there was constitutional or not. Then in the more recent case of Serrano versus Gallant Maritime, the same thing. The court, again, made use of strict scrutiny for the purpose of concluding that the distinction between those OFWs with remaining contract periods of less than one year compared to OFWs with more than one year remaining in their contract periods was valid or not. Now let's talk about the two aspects or components of due process, procedural and substantive. Procedural is basically about the means, the manner, and the method by which life, liberty, or property may be taken away. So it refers to the regularity in the manner, the method, or the means. It's about procedure. And this essentially means notice and hearing. On the other hand, substantive due process would go to the very essence of the law itself. So there may be compliance with procedural due process, but it may fail when it comes to 
the standard of substantive due process. So when it comes to substantive due process, the questions to be asked would be, is the law reasonable? Is it arbitrary? Is it just? So this has something to do with the validity of the law itself. In the development of due process, it started with procedural due process only. Substantive due process only came about much later, particularly when it was already being used by the American courts as a basis for determining the validity of government acts. So under procedural due process, just to highlight the distinction between the two, let's assume that the penalty for cheating during exams is death. <laughs> under procedural due process, if someone is caught cheating, then he would be informed of the charge, the evidence would be presented against him, and he would now have his own day in court to explain why he is not guilty. If after trial it is found out that he indeed cheated and therefore is guilty, then the penalty of death would be implemented. He would be executed. There would be no problem about procedural due process. He was duly notified and he had his day in court. But if you were now to make use of substantive due process, then it would be an entirely different thing. Because now you would be asking yourself, is the penalty of death reasonable for that kind of offense? And obviously you would come to the conclusion that no, it should not be reasonable. Otherwise, you may be among the dead by now. <laughs> so that basically highlights the difference between procedural and substantive due process. Again, when it comes to procedural, it's essentially about notice and hearing. But when it comes to substantive due process, you have to factor in the very essence of the law itself. When it comes to procedural due process also, again, take note of the relativity of due process. You keep on saying the same term over and over again. But it doesn't mean the same thing in all kinds of proceedings. Just to highlight once more the difference between judicial and administrative proceedings, you would readily appreciate that in administrative proceedings, adherence to technical rules are not that strict. Therefore, it is a general rule when it comes to administrative proceedings that a hearing may be conducted even if there is no trial type of proceeding. You can be considered to have been heard even if the only thing that you did was to file your feelings. But in judicial proceedings, normally you have these trial type proceedings. But whether you have a trial type proceeding or not in an administrative proceeding, that would still be considered as complying with the due process requirements. In the case of Mark Jimenez, Secretary of Justice versus Blanchard, particularly on the resolution of the motion for reconsideration, then Justice Pono said that due process means determining what process is due, the extent of the process that is due, and when it is due. He had to come up with this kind of a statement in order to explain away the court's decision not to allow Mark Jimenez to participate in the evaluation stage of the institution process. Because in the earlier 
or in the original decision, the Supreme Court said that it is never too early to afford Mark Jimenez his entitlement to due process because his liberty interests are already at stake. Therefore, even as early as the evaluation stage, he should already be allowed to participate. But the motion for consideration, the Supreme Court saw otherwise and said he is entitled to due process, no doubt. But that entitlement to due process does not necessarily mean that he should be allowed to participate in the evaluation stage of the exhibition process. His entitlement to due process should also be weighed with the requirement under international law for the Philippines to comply in good faith with its treaty obligations, which is a very important obligation on the part of the Philippines. So in that case, the Supreme Court said, if you allow Mark Jimenez to participate in the evaluation stage, that would mean that he may delay the proceedings and thereby impair the ability of the Philippine government to comply with its treaty obligations. Anyway, he would be entitled to his due process and his right to fully participate and be heard if ever the petition for extradition would be filed in court. But in the meantime, he should be excluded from these proceedings. So that's the case of Mark Jimenez relative to, relative to due process as applied to the evaluation stage of extradition proceedings. In so far as the requirement of notice is concerned, we have the old case of Mulane versus Central Hanover Bank and Trust Company, where the U.S. Supreme Court said that there must be a substance, substantive and meaningful compliance with the notice requirement. It's not enough that you just go through the motion, because that would not be compliance with due process. Process which is mere gesture is not due process. In that case, there was a law in New York which allowed the, the one which was managing certain trust accounts to notify the beneficiaries of the settlement of those accounts simply through publication. The Supreme Court said nowadays with so many getting published, it's hardly reasonable to think that those affected by this notice would ever come across these publications. So it's not enough to reach them through publication. Accordingly, for those beneficiaries whose names and addresses are known, then they should not be reached simply through publication. They must be reached through letters addressed to them. In that way, there will be a good opportunity to reach them so that if they are minded, then they would be able to go to the court and assert whatever rights they may have. As for those whose names or whose addresses are not otherwise part of the record, then there's no other way to try to reach them except through publication. So in that way, it is good enough. In the Philippines itself, we have the case of Sayaan v. Kamelek, where the Supreme Court said that the mere fact that a resolution of the Kamelek saying that the administrative investigation into the certificates of candidacy of the candidates would begin from the time that they have been filed is not good enough as a notice to those candidates who filed the certificates of candidacy that there might be a question in regard to those certificates. While it might have been published that there would be an administrative inquiry, it does not necessarily follow 
that those really affected, those whose certificates of candidacy would now be subjected to this kind of inquiry, would know whether their certificates are indeed being investigated or not. So if they do not know, because they have not been notified, then how do they come forward and present their own controverting evidence? So the court said it's not good enough. The publication would not serve the purposes of a notice as mandated by the due process clause. In uh, Cerrillar, we have the situation of a petition for cancellation or an annulment of a birth certificate of the alleged victim of Halusos. So remember, Halusos was charged with statutory rape, which is that kind of rape committed by members of Congress, you know. <laughs> Important element of a charge for statutory rape would be the fact that the victim is less than 12 years old. In this case of Sarilar, it was alleged that the entries in the birth certificate of that victim were false, from the names of the attending physician to that of the parents and most of especially, of course, the date of birth. The problem is, a copy of the petition, the summons, was served on the civil registrar of Manila, but not on the person whose birth certificate is an issue. The Supreme Court said that decision that was eventually rendered by the court would not be binding on that person whose birth certificate was an issue because she was never served with notice. It was done through publication, but the court said that would not be good enough. In regard to the need for prior notice, of course there would be some exceptions. Some things may have to be done even before notice because of the need to take immediate action. So you have, for instance, a case of Pop Central and Filipinas versus Valenzuela regarding the so-called closed down here later doctrine when it comes to bank operations. If the Pop Central and Filipinas determines, for instance, that there's a need to immediately close the bank because of certain irregularities or insolvency issues, then the same may have to be done even without a prior notice and hearing because there's a need to immediately protect the interest of the banking public. So hearings to be subsequently conducted to determine whether there was really a basis or there's a need to permanently close the bank. But in the meantime, at least the assets of the bank will be preserved while awaiting the outcome of this hearing. When it comes to the SEC and the issuance of this so-called cease and desist orders, in the recent case of GSIS versus Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court said that under the Securities Regulation Code, there are three distinct sections which provide for the issuance of cease and desist orders. If the SEC would now issue a CDO, it is not right that it simply comes up with a blanket issuance of a CDO based on these three without specifying the real basis. Because according to the Supreme Court, the different sections which authorize the issuance of CDOs have different requisites. Therefore, for the respondent to properly get informed so that he can, he can prepare 
for its defense. Then it is necessary that the SEC should specify what particularly is the basis, whether it's one section, other section, or the third section, which now justifies the issuance of a CDO. In the Philippines, the Inquirer versus Alameda, the Supreme Court also said that if there is a motion to dismiss predicated on the alleged failure of the complaint to state a cause of action, then that motion must be resolved simply based on the contents of the complaint and not on some other extraneous considerations. Because if the court would now consider some other considerations which are not in the complaint itself, it would be unfair, it would be a violation of the right of the plaintiff to procedural due process. In regard to evidence, we have the so-called hierarchy of evidentiary values. And for that, we have the case of Manalo versus Roldan Professor. The Manalo spouses, like so many other Filipinos desirous of a better life, applied to work abroad. They were luckier than many because they actually got to the place where they were supposed to be employed. For many other Filipinos, the closest that they could get to a foreign land is the airport. The problem is, when they got to the place where they were supposed to be deployed, they realized that the jobs waiting for them were different from what were promised them while still in the Philippines. So they did not stay long, they came back to the Philippines and filed the case against their recruiter for the cancellation of its license. The POEA required them to submit clear and convincing evidence. But they failed. Therefore, the POEA ruled against them. When the case reached the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said there is such a thing as hierarchy of evidentiary values. On top of being proof beyond reasonable doubt, and this is followed by clear and convincing evidence. After that, you have preponderance of evidence, and finally, substantial evidence. Proof beyond reasonable doubt is needed for conviction in criminal cases. Preponderance of evidence would be needed for the prevailing party in a civil action. While substantial evidence is not required in administrative proceedings. In so far as clear and convincing evidence is concerned, you normally utilize the same or need that to overcome the presumption of regularity in a performance of official duty, as well as to disprove a notarized document. So, a notarized document carries with it the presumption of due execution. In order to overcome that, you would need clear and convincing evidence. The Supreme Court explained that the proceedings before the POEA are administrative in nature. Therefore, what would only be needed for a party to prevail would be substantial evidence. But here, the POEA required clear and convincing evidence. But anything wrong with that? The court said yes. To require more than what is required for a particular proceeding would be to violate the party's right to due process. Under the due process clause, since what you have before the POEA is administrative, 
then if the party complaining was able to prove his case by substantial evidence, that should already be enough. Here, their relief was denied because they were asked to substantiate by clear and convincing evidence. And the Supreme Court said, looking at the evidence presented by the Manalo spouses before the POEA, the same constituted substantial evidence. It was good enough for the purpose of securing the relief that they prayed for. So to ask for more than the degree that is required by the proceedings, that would be a violation of procedural due process. Conversely, if you require less, that would also be a violation of due process. Like, you cannot convict an accused simply by preponderance of evidence, because that would be less than what is required. It's also a requirement of due process that the proof against the accused must be one beyond reasonable doubt. In regard to procedural due process also, aside from notice and hearing, there's also the requirement of the presence of an impartial judge or tribunal. Because it would be useless being allowed to say everything that you want if the judge hearing you would just be giving you the formality of saying your piece, but actually has already made up his mind. A judge is supposed to decide after he would have heard the parties. He is not supposed to have prejudged the case. So he has to be impartial, not favoring any of the parties. And his decision should only be dictated by the evidence that's presented before him. When it comes to this requirement for the presence of an impartial judge or tribunal, a favorite of mine is Makalintal v. Teng. Makalintal here is the lawyer of GMA, but I think this happened long before GMA was ever a client of Tony Makalintal. So he is a seasoned election lawyer. Makalintal v. Teng is about an election case that he was then handling before Judge Teng somewhere in Batangas, I think it's Rosario. Dr. Makalintal noticed that Judge Teng was somehow not that impartial. So perhaps when he could not take it any longer, he decided to file a motion for Judge Teng to inhibit himself. But Judge Teng was sort of a character. What did he do? Well, normally when a party files a motion to inhibit, the other party would take care of opposing such motion if it feels that there is no basis for the same. Here, it was not the other party. Instead, it was Judge Teng himself. He hired the services of a lawyer who filed a motion to oppose that motion for inhibition. His lawyer prayed for denial of the motion. But worse than that, he also asked that Judge Teng order Attorney Makalintal to pay 100,000 pesos by way of attorney's fees and costs of the suit. So Judge Teng thereafter resolved the motion, of course, in his paper. He denied it and 
ordered a Karimakalintal to pay as prayed for by the Council of Justice. So, Tony Mahalintal brought up the case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, What are you still doing, sir? Get out! <laughs> so, elementary, isn't it? So, how, how could the judge have done that? Was he graduated from USD? <laughs> another example, or another favorite of mine is the case of. Katatian versus Liwanan. Liwanan was a judge and he had a personal criminal case against Katatian. He filed it in his own sala. I think it was in San Jose in Bulacan before. So when he was asked to explain why he did that, he said it's because his sala is the only court in that place. Therefore, he cannot find it anywhere else. The Supreme Court said, be that as it may, still you cannot do it. It, it is only very clear that you cannot be the complainant, prosecutor, and judge at the same time. In this case, the judge was only fine. Why? Because he had already been earlier dismissed in regard to some other administrative case. In the office of the court administrator versus Floro, still remember? Judge Floro claimed that he had three war friends, which he alone can see and converse with. He also had this unusual belief system. And he claimed that he can write a decision while in a trance. He also said that he had been seen by other people in two different places at the same time. So given all of this and other works in his personality, the Supreme Court said, sorry, but we cannot allow you to stay longer in the judiciary. You are not being dismissed or separated because of what you have done. It is simply that your unusual belief system would be incompatible with the requirement of an impartial judge who should decide cases based on what are presented in the courts. But in this particular case, if he is now consulting dwarves that he alone can see, how would you have that kind of an impartial mind and decision making? If you remember, he also wanted to apply for the position of Chief Justice. Right? <laughs> and he was warned. What did the JVC say? Better shut up. <laughs> in regard to internal deliberations, we have the recent case of Mendoza versus Comelec. This has something to do with the gubernatorial race for Bulacan. This is not with regard to the latest decision. It was the one that preceded the latest decision. Mendoza claimed that when the Comelec started to deliberate at the premises of the Senate Electoral Tribunal, where the ballot boxes were then stored, he should have been notified and given an opportunity to be present. The Supreme Court said there is no violation of due process here. Because at that stage, it was no longer an adversarial proceeding. It's no longer a time when parties to a case must be present in order to be heard. The hearings had already been concluded. What was only done was the deliberation, the internal deliberation, by the Comelec. Therefore, in internal deliberations, the parties do not have the right to be present. There is no violation of due process if they are not present in that 
kind of activity for the persons who decide. When it comes to judgments, there is a requirement in the Constitution that the judge or the judgment or the decision must allege or at least indicate the factual and legal basis. It's not enough that there is just a conclusion without specifying how it was arrived at. That's a requirement of due process. Because if the judgment simply says the plaintiff wins and you are the defendant, how are you now going to appeal your case? You do not have any findings by the judge that you can at least bring up to the court and say that finding is wrong because it does not conform to the evidence or it is contrary to the law. At least you have basis now to assail the same. But if what you only get is a judgment that says plaintiff wins, period, then that would be a violation of due process. When it comes to administrative decisions, there's also the requirement under Antibi that the judgment must refer to what was presented before the proceedings or at least contained in the records. And that the parties must at least know from the judgment as to what was the basis for that judgment. There's also a requirement under Antibi that in administrative cases or proceedings, it may happen that the one rendering the decision is not really the one who heard the parties because the same may be delegated. Like if you go to labor, the labor arbiters many times would just let the socioeconomic analyst, for instance, hold hearings. And after that, it is possible that this same person would also be the one to draft the decision. But the decision would be under the hand of the arbiter. So it's the arbiter who would really be named as the one who decided the case. So in that instance, under the guidelines of Antibi, the arbiter should not simply swallow everything that was submitted to him by his subordinate. The arbiter must still make independent determination, use his own judgment, and thereafter come up with a decision. In the case of Camposano, the Supreme Court said that the Secretary of Health here simply made reference to the findings of another agency which was submitted to him and thereafter came up with the decision of dismissal. So in effect, he did not make use of his own independent discretion and judgment. And therefore, that judgment is effective. However, when it comes to the ombudsman, we have to remember that the ombudsman has to have several investigations, preliminary investigations, but this could not possibly be done personally by the ombudsman. So for that purpose, he has several investigating prosecutors or subordinates. These are the ones who will now be responsible for conducting the preliminary investigation. After that, they will come up with the summary of their findings and the recommendation, whether to drop the case or to proceed to file the case before something can be filed. What the ombudsman would then do is to simply indicate by a marginal note whether he approves, namely that he agrees or disapproves of such a recommendation. So if the recommendation, for instance, is for the dropping of the case, 
the Ombudsman indicates that he agrees by approving that recommendation. The case is dropped. Or if he disagrees, then it means that an information should be filed before the Sandigan file. So in instances like this, you can see that the Ombudsman does not come up with an extended discussion why he approves or disapproves the recommendation of his subordinate. Is this good enough? The Supreme Court has said, yes, it's good enough. Because the Ombudsman is vested with discretion to agree or disagree with his subordinate's recommendations. When he makes his decision to agree or disagree, it necessarily implies that he had already exercised his discretion. Given the same facts as set out in the summary and recommendation, it means that he either agrees or disagrees with those recommendations based on the same set of facts. Therefore, there is no more need for him to again spell out in detail why he agrees or not. So it's as if, given the same set of facts, he comes up with a different conclusion. Therefore, he disagrees or disapproves the recommendation. But if he agrees, then he would just approve the same. There is no need for him to come up with more detailed explanation. Let's take a break.